Good morning. I'm going to be doing the scripture reading this morning, so I'm going to give you a minute to kind of get your place. We're going to be in the book of Romans, chapter 1, and if you're grabbing the Bible that's in front of you, it's on page 939. So take a moment, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 32, and again, on the page that's, on the, I'm sorry, the Bible that's in front of you, it's on page 939. My name is Dick Attaway, and I am serving here in the hospitality team, part of the crew that tries to welcome you as often as we can when we're out front. Um, I'm also a life group leader, and I've been a covenant member here at the church for nine years. All right, one more time. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 32, and in the Bible in front of you, page 939. Follow with me. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is God's word. Praise be to God. Good morning. My name is Mark McPherson. I am over student ministry here at TDC. I'm privileged to be on our preaching team. Uh, we're going to finish chapter one of the book of Romans today. We've been traveling through the book of Romans, and uh, we are going to go through it. We'll take a break during Advent uh, and come back to it at the beginning of next year. Uh, today's sermon style is called Honorable Passions. Honorable Passions. Church, would you pray with me before we get started? Father, let the med meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. God, we know that the grass will wither, the flower will fall, but your word is eternal. I pray that your word would point us to the cross, point us to the righteousness afforded to us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his mighty name that we pray. Amen. So when I was coaching wrestling, uh, I would always play music, always for the kids. It was just like essential for me, so I, kids always had to listen to music. Uh, so sometimes you're playing like movie scores. That was one of my favorites because it made them feel like they're in something way bigger than themselves, like this epic adventure. Sometimes you play like, you know, hip hop music or just like new music that's loud, techno, whatever. Uh, but my favorite thing to make kids listen to while we wrestled was jazz. Jazz was great because it set a bass line and then there was all this kind of crazy music all over the place and it kind of, I was trying to subconsciously teach kids like you could be steady Eddie and also creative and crazy through jazz. That's, that's just, I'm just, that's what I thought at least. I don't think they got that. I just thought it was great. I was like this, if you can understand that, you can understand how to wrestle. Well, one of my favorite stories about that was I, I trained this young lady named uh, Brooke for two years. She was one of the most amazing young students, young persons I've ever got to coach. Uh, and so she knew I liked jazz. She was okay with it. So one day I'm playing uh, jazz as we're warming up uh, over there at Cottville High School with all the girls and the girls' practice. And uh, I'm playing John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. And I don't know if you ever heard A Love Supreme by John Coltrane, but it starts, it's seven minutes of jazz. And it starts with this bass line that's famous. It's dum 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 and that's the whole first like six minutes of this song and at the very end John Coltrane himself sings on the track a love supreme a love supreme to match the bass line so I'm the song has just begun and I'm messing with this girl Brooke uh, and I go Brooke can you hear him it's going dum, 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 dum. and I'm going can you hear him singing a love supreme 
a love supreme. And she's like, stop messing with me. It's just music. It's just bass. Stop messing with me. I'm like, you can't hear that, Brooke? You can't hear him going, a love supreme, a love supreme. And she's like, just quit messing with me. And I go, Brooke, if you can't hear him singing those words, you're not listening with your heart, Brooke. You're not listening with your heart. And I'm just messing with her. And I'm going around, I'm coaching all these kids. And if you've ever seen a wrestling practice, all these people bent down, touching each other. And, and at the end of the song, he starts to sing. John Coltrane comes over the bass line. He begins to sing, I love Supreme. And I just watch her pop up like Groundhog's Day. And she's looking at me. And she goes, Coach, Coach. I go, what's up, Brooke? She goes, I can hear it. I can hear it. I said, way to use your heart, Brooke. Way to use your heart. She was listening with her heart. I, was, I always love that story. I always joke about it because sometimes when we come to God's word with tough passages like today, ones that are, are so obviously speaking to our hearts and to our culture, I'm wondering, are we only hearing the baseline? Or do we hear God's word for us? Do we hear our chief shepherd speaking to us? us? Is he speaking to me? Do I have ears to hear his love supreme for me through his word? As we look at this text, I just want to look at three things. Uh, It's so packed and so dense. I just want to try to unpack it for us this morning. I want to look at three things. The giving approval, the giving up, and the giving all. The giving approval, the giving up, and the giving all. First, the giving approval. Why is it when we think of death, the first things that we think of are the funeral homes? We think of the dirt that we dig up. We think of the casket. See, in the latter part of chapter 1 in the book of Romans, Paul has been fleshing out the effects of the fall. He's been fleshing out Genesis 3 for us. This is what we see since the fall. He's been fleshing it out for us, the effects of it, that we are actually in spiritual death and decay, just as if a skeleton was in a box. It's dead and it's decaying. Paul is playing that out for us. He's showing us our spiritual death and decay and the seriousness of it and how we actually have to be awakened to the problem of death To see that it's spiritual and not just a physical reality, but it's a spiritual reality. We we, we are are almost blind to it. The spiritual aspect of death, that's what it says in verse 28, that we actually are given up to a debased mind. This is a, a reduced mind, a debased mind. This is part of the passive wrath of God, that we've been given up to this debased mind. I love what it says. It says that, that uh, we, to, to do what ought not to be done, because we, do, we know what ought to be done. We've been given up to a debased mind. We actually know the difference between right and wrong, and yet we suppress the truth. We suppress it. It's debased. Our thinking is, is reduced. We know right and wrong. That's what it says in verse 32. It says that they, though they know God's righteous decree, we know right from wrong. See, like that's what all verses 19 through 23 are all about. It's like God's invisible attributes, that there's an objective moral reality. Like there's moral reality that's true. There is right and wrong. And there's also the creation that we worship over the creator. That's what 19 through 23 is all about. This is our debased mind that we actually know right from wrong, yet we suppress it. And we worship the creation over the creator. I did a wedding two weeks ago, and I saw all these uh, young ladies weeping and crying as we're talking about covenant, commitment, and marriage. And I speak to them. They're saying, what you said was so beautiful, was so nice, but I know that they don't like the author of it. They don't like the creator of, of, of marriage. I know them personally. I know what they're saying to me. They're saying, I really love the poem, but I don't like the author because the author has authority, and I don't like that. So I like this little ceremony. I like the word you're saying, but I don't like the creator of it. And that's all of us, and we all fall short, and we all actually deserve to die. That's what it says in verse 32. It says, those who practice such things deserve to die, and that's really at the core of all of us. We all truly believe it, and we all know it. You want to know how I know that you know? It's because we all walk around with an unsettled consciousness. 
We walk around with this unsettled consciousness, if I had to define that. It's the feeling of guilt, shame, and regret. The feeling of guilt, shame, and regret, and the haunting reality that within ourselves, we see nor have any ability to change. The feeling of guilt, shame, and regret, and the haunting reality that within ourselves we see nor have any ability to change. This is like when I was using drugs. I would use drugs, and I would, I would deep down feel that it was wrong. And I knew there was something wrong about it. And I knew I was hurting my relationships around me. And also, I knew that I was going against my own creation. Like, I was harming my body as I did it. But I didn't, I didn't run from drugs. You just do more drugs. You get high to, re- to forget that you got high. That's our debased mind running in this cycle of guilt and shame and regret and this haunting reality that we cannot change and being unable to change doesn't lead us to repentance. It doesn't lead us into the arms of the Father. But it leads us to look inward, to self-justify. That's what verse 32 is all about. They know God's righteous decree They practice these things. They deserve to die. But not only do they do them, but they give approval to those who practice those. We give approval to our sin. We give approval and we look for others. We we first look inward and we try to self-justify our sin. And then we look to others to validate our sin. That there might be some kind of safety in numbers. Our debased mind leads us into debased movements these echo chambers of sinful thought where our dishonorable passions are actively addicted, actively addicted to working tremendously hard to self-justify our design over the Creator's design. Our debased minds lead us into debased movements and we give approval to one another to self-justify our sin and we're actively addicted at it. I mean, we are addicted to doing this, that our design goes over the, the creation and the, uh, uh, over the creator's design of creation. Paul uses in the text in verses 26 through 27, homosexuality. In Colossians 3, he uses greed. He says covetousness, which is idolatry, he uses greed. In, in Galatians 4, verses 8 and 9, he says, you worship pagan idols. Why would you go back into that form of slavery when they are trying to live up to the law? Whether it's homosexuality or greed or even a biblical morality that you are trying to live uh, uh, self-justified, that you're trying to save yourself through your good works, no matter what it is, if it's a self-serving idol worship, it's sin. And what it does is it covers up the deeper sin within all of our hearts that's believing the lie of Satan that you surely won't die. I mean, that's what happened to Adam. Adam heard, surely you won't die. And he ate from the fruit, and right away he experienced spiritual death. But it took him a while to die, physically. And that's our debased minds. We live in spiritual death and decay. We self-justify. We don't feel death right away. And so we think we're okay. You know, as we look at this text... I think about all the times I'm hearing in our society, hey, man, it's the worst it's ever been. And I'm at this wedding talking to people and talking about Jesus, and, and they're like, well, thank goodness you're here. It's, it, you know, our society needs this. It's the worst it's ever been. It's the worst it's ever been because we are the worst we've ever been. And I'm saying we, not just them out there. I mean we, us, all of us. I hear at the wedding, I was talking about Jesus, talking about covenant. People say, we need this, especially nowadays. We need this, especially nowadays. Yeah, it's because these are the days that we live in. It's the days that we live in. This is to be spoken over us. We all have debased minds that lead us to look inward, to self-justify sin. And even worse, we look out into the world to self-justify, to find an echo chamber of sinful thought, a debased movement, to, to feel validated. We're looking in ourselves and out into the world to solve the spiritual reality of our death and decay by approving of it. 
rather than looking to the one in whose image we are made to know him and reflect him. If you like Star Wars, you'll get this, but if you don't, you still get it. I'll make it make sense. Uh, Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, there's uh, the evil emperor who's coming into power for the first time. And so he's starting this, if you know Star Wars, there's a dark lord and he's got Darth Vader on his side or whatever. And he, this is the beginning of all that. He's starting this evil empire. And as he's starting this galactic evil empire, he's talking to the Senate, the galactic Senate. And he says, I'm going to have this empire. We're all going to be safe. And everybody applause. And then there's Princess Amidala. She's the good one. Or Princess, I don't know how to say her name, Natalie Portman. She's like, Princess Almond, or whatever her name is, she, uh, she says this. She says, this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. This is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. And it's so easy to hear that sentence and go, that's our culture. That's our country. That's our world. But I'm challenging you today to know that liberty is dying within your heart, to thunderous applause, within us all. When sin reigns and we validate it, our hearts roar with thunderous applause. All like sheep have gone astray. All, all like sheep. And our idol worship of self, our idol worship of self will always lead to the taste of bitterness and wickedness that our spiritual death and decay produces. And our unsettled consciousnesses and our debased minds will always miss the beauty of this world as we miss the creator of it, trading the truth for a lie. Secondly, the giving up, the giving up, the passive wrath of God. See, the real question for us is, are, it's not are you trading the truth for a lie, it's where are you trading the truth for a lie. It's not are you trading the truth for a lie, but where are you trading a truth for a lie? Where's your idle blind spot? Where are you worshiping yourself and you're blind to it? That's the thing about a blind spot. It's back here. It's in your peripheral. You can't see that. It's a blind spot. That's the grace. That's the beauty of the passive wrath of God. You see this pattern that's happening from verse 24 to verse 28. It says uh, in verse 24 that he gave us up to the lust of our hearts. In verse 26, he gave us up to dishonorable passions. In verse 28, he gave us up to a debased mind. And all that's happening is God is giving us up to saying, if you want to be God for yourself, then here, taste it. And as that happens, what happens is we all fall under the banner of the manner of unrighteousness in verse 29. We all fall under this banner of all the manner of unrighteousness. This is in verse 29 down. This is a vice list. We see this scattered throughout the New Testament. They're everywhere. This is showing us our characteristics of our spiritual nature of the flesh that comes from not worshiping God, but worshiping ourselves. What we see is all kinds of societal and personal disorder and dysfunction. We see this societal breakdown in verse 29. It says, it says they, uh, they're filled with all the manner of unrighteousness, evil, coveted, malice. They are full of envy. Envy. In just one word, envy, we could see that there's so much economic disorder coming from envy. That's why we have wars. That's why we have corrupt business and corrupt people within business lying and cheating. It's literally why like sneakerheads in here can't get a pair of dunks because we have envy and our economics is all over the place. There's social, social disorder, murder, Strife, deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Social breakdown coming from our disorder within our hearts. Maybe you've never actually murdered someone. But we've all taken place in ca character assassination through gossip. Maybe you never said, I've never hated God. I've never been a hater of God. But we all take his good gifts and plagiarize them. And we're boastful. And we brag on the good gift that he has given us as if we are, it's our own. And we are our own God. There's personal breakdown. There's, there's personal and family break. Family breakdown. It, it says, uh, <laughs> disobedient to parents. Where are my students at? <laughs> You're not off the hook. 
disobedient to parents. We see family breakdown from serving ourselves. Relational breakdown, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. I think of myself and my most, my deepest relationships, how I fall here. And the people who I walk with the most and the people I'm closest to, I can feel the moments where I'm faithless, where I'm heartless. Our spiritual decay has led us to social and personal breakdown. My question for us today is, where are you not working out for you? I know the places in my life where Mark is not working out for Mark. James 4, verses 1 through 4 says this, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. I love that James ends saying, you adulterous people. Because the love of self, the idol worship of self, has to it this illusion of, uh, of this sexual lust and tension. He even says the passions you desire, you covet. It's this, 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 kind, of, this kind of nature of, it's, it's almost a relationship. This, it's almost a, a tension that, that we, we lust after ourselves. He says, you adulterous people, speaking of almost our relationship with God, that if God is to be our our husband and we are to be his bride, that we are actually cheating on him with ourselves, that we're lustful after ourselves. And that's why Paul here in verses 26 through 27 is using homosexuality as this example. Because at the root of it, it's a love of self. It's a love of sameness. The homosexuality looks at the other and says, you are like me, you are same, and I love me. To the core of it, what we all convicted is the lovers of self over God. And church, I I just want to take a second to speak on homosexuality. What the Bible speaks, we are called to speak. God's word is eternal. We know it to be true, and as we look at this text, we are to be holding this text Firm and true. I encourage you not to back away from it, especially in the culture we live in now. And there's nothing new under the sun. This isn't something new. God's word has spoken to it. And I encourage you to stand firm on this truth and not to back down from it. And church, at the same time, We are people who have been redeemed. If you are in Christ Jesus, you have tasted and seen the grace and mercy of God. And as you came with nothing in your hands, as a beggar for grace and mercy, as we speak to a people, a people group, we are to come to them in grace and mercy, in truth and in love. To be able to speak to them and say, I know that you're longing. I know that you're searching. I was there. To speak to them in truth, in love, because Christ conquers all. There's There's a beauty that we actually have that we can speak to this in our society right now. Not trying to meet them in their victimology, but actually meet them in victorology. That you're looking for an identity, you're looking for hope, you're looking for something eternal, and we have that in Christ Jesus. To come and meet them with an identity that says, you've been forgiven, you've been set free by the blood of Christ. And hear me, church, there are people who are struggling with their sexual orientation, and yet Christ is their king, and yet he has lordship over their life, and they're actually walking in righteousness, battling, struggling. And those are our brothers and sisters. Those people exist. It's, it's a crazy topic for us to talk about, but it's, it really isn't. We have the truth. We have God's word. We should not back down from it, and we should also meet them in grace and mercy. 
What a beautiful opportunity we have to shed light on truth. The passive wrath of God will show it anyway. That's what it says in verse 27, that they're all going to experience it anyway. We are all going to experience it anyway. Those who are not in Christ are all going to experience it anyway. It says in verse 27 that in themselves, they, they, uh, the, the due penalty for their error, they're receiving within themselves the due penalty of their error. The due penalty that we've all received is the passive wrath of God that lets us taste the bitterness and the wickedness of our self-serving idol worship to hopefully break us from ourselves. And we, need to, we don't need to be a people that come and speak with a hammer or with a rock at any debased movement because God will have his active wrath. He will have vengeance. His active wrath will be the physical death and hell for those who choose to never repent of their disobedience. God will not be mocked. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And when you read this text, this vice list, my prayer for you is that you'd see yourself in it. Because I see myself in it. I know myself. Apart from Christ, I see my past. I see who I can be when the Spirit of God isn't moving in me and, and guiding me. And I'm not staying close, dependent on Him. I know the moments in which I was sexually immoral. I know the moments where I was an adulterer. I know I can be greedy. I know my past of being a drunk. I know how to be a swindler. I know that's me. I know it to be true. My greatest fear this morning is that we'd see lists like this in the Bible and say, well, thank God that's not me. That's my greatest fear in this room. That you'd see a list like this and say, well, thank God that's not me. Failing to acknowledge the brokenness within yourself is failing to bring the brokenness of the world in light of the justice that's found at the cross of Christ. Failing to acknowledge the brokenness within yourself is failing to bring the brokenness of the world in light of the justice of the cross. It's in light of the cross. It's at his justice. It's, it's, it's the justice of the cross that allows us to read verse 11 of 1 Corinthians. It says this, And such were some of you. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit of our God, this is, this is me now. This is, this is who I am now, washed from myself. This is how we speak to a people. This is how we speak to our hearts. Not self-justifying in a, in a state of victimology, but, but actually speaking truth over ourselves by the Word of God as in victory. This is who I am now, I'm washed. I've been sanctified and justified. This is me now. One of my favorite movies is Gladiator. And Maximus Decimus Meridius, he can do no wrong in my eyes, but there's one scene, there's one scene where he, he shows how wrong he was. I love this scene because he's humble throughout the whole scene. Maximus is this gladiator, this Roman soldier, top of the ranks, and, and Rome turns on him. There's a new emperor that comes, and and his top man enslaves Maximus and kills his family, and he's stuck in this slave trade. Um, and there's one scene where he's taking a, a sharp rock, and he's removing this tattoo that he had that was his sign of allegiance to the Roman Empire, and he's carving away at his arm, trying to get rid of this tattoo. And his friend, who, who makes his friend, his name is Juba in the movie, or... Uh, uh, Jamon Hunsu, uh, he comes up to him and says, will that not anger your gods? And Russell Crowe, Maximus, just kind of smiles back at him because he understands him perfectly. He saw right through Maximus that Rome wasn't just his job, 
but it's where he found his status. It's where he found his power. It's where he found his meaning. And when it, he looked at the world for his meaning, it turned around and enslaved him and murdered his family and destroyed him. And rightfully so, he says, won't that offend your gods? That serving man became his god. Serving himself became his god. And look where it has led him. I don't know. If you have the NIV, it says in verse 23, it says reptiles. That's why it's the not inspired version. In verse 23, it says, uh, they serve the, the mortal man, the birds, the animals, and the creeping things. That as you worship a thing, you become a thing. You lose the image of God, you lose your humanness. As you serve yourself, you become a thing. It's the beauty and the power of a new affection. It's the beauty and the, the beauty of the new affection of the heart as you're washed and sanctified and justified and you see Christ as the king of your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, that Christ is the king of my heart, that I, the things that were in my blind spots are actually coming to the forefront, and now that I worship Christ, they're actually falling to the wayside. I don't even see them anymore. I have a passion. I have a heart to follow him in righteousness, that I actually can speak to myself through his word, he's speaking to me, saying, you are washed of all your sin. You're actually dying to yourself. You've been washed. You've been sanctified that, that he's going to move in you to change you in the way that you walk and that you actually have hope, hope away from yourself. Not hope in yourself, but hope away from you, a hope from the self. It's like you're giving yourself a holy stiff arm. It's like, I have hope. I'm going to walk in righteousness. And I've been justified. I've been made right with him by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have a right relationship with God. I've been redeemed. My, myself has been redeemed, which is crazy to think that as we come to Christ, he just doesn't turn us into robots, but he says, no, I love you. I have a purpose for you. I'm going to redeem you. He wants to redeem Mark. He wants to make me justified before him. It's the beauty of speaking identity over yourself into a culture that needs it. This is who we are in Christ Jesus. We were some of you. This, this, these lists in the Bible, that, that was some of you, but you were washed. Lastly, the giving all. This text just screams the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, one of my favorite Verses in Luke 10, is verse 16, it says, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. I love that verse because that word longing it speaks directly to our souls. Are you longing to be redeemed? Are you longing to be washed? Are you longing to be sanctified? See, this is the beauty of the cross of Christ. It's where our hope is. Our eternal hope is found at the cross of Christ because at the cross of Christ is where the renewal of our mind happens. That we're being renewed, that we actually break the chains of an unsettled consciousness and a debased mind. At the cross is where we run towards mercy and grace in the arms of the Father and we're actually running away from ourselves and where God comes and showers us in mercy that before we can even confess, he's clothing us in his righteousness. Our hope is in his very mercy and grace that as we experience mercy and grace, it actually is going to rewire our affections not to serve self, but to actually love God and serve one another. This is the beauty of the cross. This is where our hope is. And it's the beauty of the passive wrath of God. All throughout Romans 1, we're seeing this passive wrath. I'm like, show me some hope. There's beauty in the passive wrath of God because the wrath of God is showing that he's willing to give us up to ourselves. But the cross... But the cross shows us that he was willing to give up his son to save us from ourselves. The passive wrath of God shows us that he's willing to give us up to ourselves to taste the brokenness and the wickedness. But the cross shows that he gave up his own son to save us from ourselves. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says this. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his son but gave him up but gave him up. As we look through this passage, we see that he gave us up to our lustful hearts. He gave us up to dishonorable passions. He gave us up to a debased mind, but he did not spare his own son. But what? Gave him up for us. Oh, how will we not with him graciously give us all things? 
See, when you see himself giving himself up for you, you will stop giving yourself over to your self-serving idol worship. When you see himself giving himself up for you, you won't give yourself up over to yourself because it's in him that we find all things. All things. It's literally what the word says. All things. In him is your security. Your security. That as, a, as the trap door of death, that when you fall into that trap door that is the grave, you have security knowing that the arms of the Father are there to catch you. He's actually your comfort, that he's with you now by the power of the Holy Spirit, that he's accepted you. You have acceptance in him. You have been made new, washed, sanctified, a son or a daughter in the kingdom, in the family. You've been approved of. You don't have to earn it anymore. But his righteousness covers you, and he gives you the power to live a life redeemed. In him, we actually have honorable passions. In him, we see that he gave all, and so we don't have to live in economic disorder, but we can actually be a people who lives with generosity because his love of giving all is stirring in our hearts, and we actually have a freedom to give. In him, we have social flourishing because he has so loved us that we could actually begin to love others and not worry about what others think of ourselves, but we could actually use our words to build other people up. In him, we see that we could actually obey our parents, students. Why? Because he submitted to the will of his Father for us. It's in him that we actually have relational flourishing that as we see his heart for us, his faithfulness to us, that we begin to live in his strength and have faithfulness and love towards others. And it's going to take a lot of grace. And it's going to take a lot of prayer. It's going to take a lot of support. It's going to take the church. It's going to take us together. But it's together do we fight temptation, deny ourselves, and pick up our cross and follow him. It's together we do it. And we can take heart. Take heart. He's conquered the world. How will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Use your heart, Brooke. Do you hear his words speaking to you this morning? Are you sitting under it until you actually hear the words of his love supreme for you? For you. Not for anyone else out there, but for you. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is king. Jesus is king. Let's worship him as king of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, you are good and mighty, merciful and gracious. Father, I pray that we would submit to your kingdom, rule and reign. That we would see your word for us. That it wouldn't just be Noise. It wouldn't just be something we go through the motions, God, but you'd speak to us. We'd hear the voice of the chief shepherd. Shepherd, we pray that we'd, we, we would live a life consumed of your love for us. Let us go out walking in an identity that is shaped by Christ Jesus, hidden in his righteousness. Let us be humble beggars who show others the beauty that we have seen. We pray that you would rule and reign in our hearts, that you would take ground in our hearts today, and we would live with a confidence and take heart, knowing that you have conquered all. Spirit, stir in our hearts. Lead us and guide us in righteousness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, we love you, and it's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen.